Life teaches us lessons. Life teaches us lessons. Some of the lessons we don't really want to learn them <laughs> because it's too painful. The word of God says no correction at the present moment is ever pleasing. But it works on for our good. Amen? Today I'm going to speak about one life lesson. Just one. Um, beware of bitterness. Beware of bitterness. And let's turn our Bibles, if you have your Bibles, and let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews. Now we have another scripture to cover today, right? So we hoping to get through with everything. Hebrews chapter 11 from verse 14. And it says, For Hebrews 12, 14, sorry. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. I have to do wrong with the system. Sorry. It says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. It says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So we are talking about bitterness. What is bitterness? Bitterness is anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly, and it results in resentment or resentment. Resentment, however, is described a negative emotional reaction to being mistreated. A person experiencing from resentment will often feel a complex variety of emotions that include anger, disappointment, bitterness, and hard feelings. Any of you all ever experienced anything like that? You feel you, you feel anger at somebody, you feel disappointed. You feel bitter, or you have some hard feelings, you hold a grudge against somebody. Well, that is very dangerous. Bitterness is dangerous. Bitterness is also translated as bitter food, bitter poison, disaster, and poisonous water feeding the body, soul, and spirit of someone who turned their heart away from the Lord. And we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 18. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 18. So lest there should be any among you, man, woman, or family, or tribe, whose heart turned away from the Lord, the from the Lord our God, to go and serve other gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that bear gall and wormwood. Gall and wormwood, we, we, we saw uh, mentioned gall is something bitter. Bitter. You ever had bitter stomach? You ever taste something bitter? You know, sometimes you might eat something and it doesn't sit well and you get better from bitterness. Some mm -hmm. bitter, bitter thing where you eat. I wouldn't say karate. Karate these days is not bitter. But you know what I'm talking about bitterness. You know what bitterness is. Right? So the Bible refers to bitterness as bearing gall and wormwood. It's something that is tangible. There is a difference between anger and bitterness, however. Even though the symptoms look to be the same, they look to be the same. Anger lasts for a moment and is about a present hurt. And bitterness is about a past hurt that grows for years. That's the difference between anger and bitterness. Anger happens at a moment. Right? You mash my phone, I get X one time. Right? Literally, mash my phone, I get X one time. Right? 
but bitterness is something that is brewing from the past. It's something that happened in the past that you didn't deal with immediately and it starts to fester and start to grow. The thing about bitterness is that you don't you don't recognize it when it's growing. It, it, it presents itself as anger, but it's not. So we will see the difference between it. Something that happened, bitterness is about a past hurt that brews for years. Something that happened in the past that leads to resentment and holding of a grudge. Bitterness keeps us from being happy and adds no value to our lives. It adds no value to our lives. We can't, we can't control anger. Now, I'm trying to di differentiate between anger and bitterness. You can control anger. You get vexed, you know, you can talk to yourself, don't get vexed, don't get vexed, don't get vexed. Don't. Because you just know when you're getting vexed. People, you just know when you're getting vexed. If it's like me, you just feel here that you don't have any back pain or grace. So, you just know when you're going to get anger, um, angry. You can't control anger, but bitterness controls you. You can control anger. You could go to anger management. You could do whatever. You could quote how much script is. You could do whatever to control your anger. But you see bitterness? Bitterness is something that controls you. That is your master if you have bitterness. Anger is loud, but bitterness is quiet. That's why we have to look out for bitterness. When you're angry, you yell and get on bad. You know we train how we just yell. Especially when we vex. You could swear we sell in any market. How we just get on, right? Anger is loud. You, you want to, your voice has to raise above the person you're vexed with. You know how we just get on here in Trinidad. Bitterness is quiet. It doesn't speak. It will be there for years, but it doesn't speak. We, 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 we mask it with all different kind of thing. We call it all different kind of name. We label it all different kind of thing. Just so we wouldn't think it's bitterness. Just so we think, you know, to make ourselves real better. We call it by all different kind of name. We say, I, will, I, I, I forgive you, you know, but I don't want to have nothing to do with you. That's a part of bitterness, but I had, I'm getting ahead of myself. Now we are dealing with the root of bitterness. Remember that, that the scripture was saying that um, be careful before the root of bitterness take hold of you. That's the first scripture we read in Hebrews, right? The root of bitterness is a subtle enemy because it has the appearance like unforgiveness of being a justifiable response. We feel more often than not when we are bitter or well, when we get bitter and we explode, that we are justified by what we do. Because somebody has wronged us. We feel justified by blowing up, by saying what we say, by putting on the salvation and fixing up the person and then taking back up after. All right? More often than not, it is the offshoot of unforgiveness and the truth is that it cannot exist Truth and the truth is that it cannot exist in a forgiven heart. Left unchecked, a bitter root can lead to ruin and destruction. To understand its power, we need to understand the purpose of a root and how it works in our lives. We all know what a root is. A short, we, we have plants in the yard, we have grass in the yard, we have weeds in the yard, and sometimes we don't just spray with root stuff, we pull it up. If we have a plant in the yard that has been there for years, we take a fork and we dig it out. We know what roots are, right? The root of bitterness is like any other root. The primary function of a root is to act as an anchor. It digs deep and develops, in, it develops phenomenal strength and tenacity. Think of the enormous trees and what strength and power their roots must have to keep them stable and secure. The root of bitterness has the same purpose. It anchors us or ties us to the negative situation that generated the, the root in the first place. We cannot move on and cannot free ourselves. To all intents and purposes, the root has us stuck in one place. So we see that the root, you don't see a tree get up from where it is after it's been, after it grown, except in the movies. You don't see them get up and walk and go and plant themselves somewhere else. We, in the Bible, we are, we are um, likened unto trees. In Psalms 1, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring it forth fruit in its season. In Isaiah it says that we are the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. These are just instances of us being likened unto trees. The Lord says that those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. 
Are they getting me where I'm going right now? So we see that the root is very important. The root stabilizes the tree to the ground. So no matter how much storm comes, that root will keep that tree strong. The taller the tree, the deeper the roots. Right? We don't see a tree planted in, a, in the middle of a, a, a waterway, like a river. You don't see a tree, not often, planted in the middle of, a water, of the waterway and on the land at the same time. There is either one or the other. Right? So next, the, the root is the primary point of supply to the plant's needs. To try, sorry, the root is the primary point of supply for all that the plant needs to try and to grow. It is the roots that absorb the minerals, nutrients from the soil and send them up the tree. The root of bitterness does the same. It continues to feed us with the negative, bitter emotions, thus defiling us by tainting what is within us. We are essentially feeding on our own bitterness. And the more we feed, the more bitter is, bitterness is produced. Ultimately, what the root of bitterness feeds us will overcome everything else. That is, if it's left unchecked, if it's not dealt with, it will, the more you, you think about the situation is the more that you get vexed when you have bitterness. And the more that you get vexed is the more negative emotions that is flowing in your life. And after a while, because these things happen over a period of time, and after a while, bitterness happens over a period of time. Anger happens instant, instantaneously, right? So the, deeper, the, the, the great danger of the root of bitterness is that we cannot see it growing. It happens below the ground. Roots grow below the ground. So we can't see when this thing is growing in our lives. It happens below the ground and the tree may live for years apparently healthy and strong. It starts small and digs deep, slowly growing and strengthening and releasing its poison. It takes a long time before it usurps control over the tree. But a believer with a root of bitterness is no longer rooted in Christ. Hmm. This, is, this is a very dangerous place to be. When you have bitterness in your life, now, remember that we read scriptures that says, be rooted and grounded in God, right? In love. Apostle brought that scripture this morning as well. If we are, whatever happens in our life, what we allow to fester in our lives will eventually overtake us. If we read the Bible and we pray and we, we put that into our spirit, that is what we will become. We will become righteous. We will become as what God says. But if we allow the root of bitterness to take over, you, you just know a bitter person by the way they look in. You just look miserable. You just know a bitter person. Now all of this came about when a person told me that I had to preach this today. All this. <laughs> you all don't understand well, eh? Right. When a person told me I had to preach today, I'm like, hold me. I'm like, Lord, what am I to say? I have not spoken with him concerning anything about what I'm preaching today, nothing, nothing, nothing. But you see, God has a very healthy sense of humor. Every time I have to preach, I have to experience something in order to preach that. This week has been one of the longest and toughest week for me, personally, spiritually, physically, emotionally, all in me as you could think about. This week has been it. When this thing happened and Ask, I start to ask God, say, Lord, what, what am I supposed to preach? What am I supposed to preach? And I keep hearing bitterness, root of bitterness, root of bitterness, root of bitterness. And I say, like, Lord, you really have a sense of humor, you know, because uh, I, hmm, hmm, hmm. When I started to do the study for this, this particular message, I was so shocked. I was taken back to a childhood memory of something I have never dealt with. Now remember, bitterness is something from the past that brews over years. I am talking about childhood as a big woman now. And you're talking about being a, from being a child. This distinct memory came straight back to me. And God was telling me, this is the way it began. This is where everything began. The way that you think, the way that you feel, the way that you experience things, the way that you react to things. 
this is where it began. And everybody has an experience, everybody has a place, a starting point. Remember the Bible says, remember where you are fallen and repent. Mm -hmm. Remember where you are fallen and repent. Mm -hmm. So this is how this, this particular, I'm not going to give any experience because it's, 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 it's a bit too personal for me. But um, I'm not going to give any experience. Just know that the experience came up and I had to deal with it. Bitterness is found to make a person ill, physically ill. You ever get, you ever feel so bitter that your stomach just turn? You can't eat nothing? You, you, well, I literally felt on Monday night, I literally felt my body change. Nobody didn't have to tell me. I literally felt my body change. I need you all to know this. Just because you are a pastor or a woman of God, a man of God, doesn't make you a robot, eh? You still have experiences just like everybody else. You still experience anger. You still experience hatred. You still experience all these things. It's what you do with it. It makes a difference. But it does not mean because you are a pastor or an apostle or a deaconess or a, a, a woman's leader or whatever it is, it does not make or a worship leader. It does not mean that you are a robot. You have feelings. Right? But difference is what you do with them. Bitterness is found to make a person ill. Holding on to bitterness can affect someone's metabolism, their immune response, the organ function, and lead to physical diseases if left unchecked. Sister Anne was preaching last week and she was saying that, you know, many of the emotions that we have, the diseases that we have, are tied to emotions. I am not going on that route, but I'm just reminding you what she said, right? It was, it's tied to emotions. And if you go backwards, remember the Bible says, remember, to remember, right? Remember where you have fallen. When you trace back and you go back to it, you realize that certain things affect the way that you live. You eat, sometimes when you're depressed, you eat too much, too much food because you're looking for comfort. And if the comfort, if food is the comfort you get at the time, well, then you go with that. But if it's something else, you go with that. Whatever brings you comfort at the time. I'm just saying food because I like chocolate. And that's my go-to when I'm feeling kind of dumb. Chocolate. It, you know, it, but then afterwards I get depressed because one minute on the lips and forever on the hips. So my body is a chocolate body. Anybody can tell that, right? Good. So we're talking about bitterness. Holding on to bitterness affects your physical being. We were made spirit, soul, and body, right? One, everything is tied together. And when one is out of balance, everything is out of balance. We must be balanced people as Christians, right? As humans on the whole, we must be balanced. That's why when you go to the, the, the dietitian, they tell you you must eat a, a, a balanced diet, right? You must have that in order to function properly. So what are some of the signs of bitterness and resentment? Receiving, sorry, reoccurring negative feelings towards people or situations that hurt you. When you're constantly thinking about the thing that hurt you all the time, 20 years, you know they say you're buried the hatchet, but you leave the handle sticking out? You're buried the hatchet and all, but you leave the handle sticking out. Sometimes I think I bury the hatchet in other people. I don't know why, but you can't, you always pull it back up that, that particular thing. 20 years, 40 years, 60 years down the road, you still remember when somebody knew you something when you was a little child. She didn't share, she, um, I went and I buy um, sugar cake, and because I buy the sugar cake, somebody went and tell somebody else that I went and buy the sugar cake, and by the time I reach home, I get licks. And you remember the licks that you get for the sugar cake, 20, 40 years, 60 years after the fact. Some people still live in a mentality of, of, of back then, when they were children. The background that they had, poverty, they didn't come out from the, men the mentality, didn't change, the mindset didn't change, so they still live in things that, you know, should have been given over to God. Recurring negative feeling towards people, situations that hurt you. The next thing is inability to stop thinking about the event. If you're constantly bringing up the event, now these are some of the signs of resentment eh? and some of the signs of bitterness. If you're constantly bringing it up, all the time thinking about it, you're becoming bitter. Feelings of regret or remorse. Fear or avoidance. I don't want to see the person because if I see the person, I'll just frighten up or just blow up again. Or, or avoid it. I better just avoid the person and done the whole story. 
right? I forgive you enough, but I avoid you. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. And a tense relationship. What bitterness does is it, it produces tense relationships. If you're bitter towards somebody, you could never be in a good relationship with that person. Because something or the other, they will say in your mind will always run back to the event. Your mind will also, why she say so? She have ulterior mood. You'll always be suspicious of the person. You can never have a good relationship because you're always suspicious of what the person is saying. You're reading into the thing more than it really is. All right? Bitter, let me, we're going to look at four people in the Bible who, are very, who were bitter. Now, I'm only taking from the Old Testament, but you could do your research. I am not doing every single thing, but you could do your research. The first thing is Cain. The first person is Cain. We're looking at Genesis chapter 4 from verse 1. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. And it says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man child from the Lord. And she can bear his, son, his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass. Now we have to understand something. When we read from one, one verse to the next verse, it's not an immediate something. Time passed in between. When the Bible says a process of time, it means time was going. When it said it came, it came to pass, that means time passed. So we have to read the Bible with this understanding, right? And she bear another, uh, she bear his brother Abel, and was a, he was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first things of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. But unto Cain and his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, meaning real mad. And his countenance fell. Sometimes, like me, when you see I'm next, you just know it is show on the face. I don't know about for everybody else, but I can talk about myself. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt not thou, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass again. Time passed. This is after the sacrifice was refused. Right? Time passed. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, Why hast thou, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cried unto me from the ground. And then we know the rest about how he cursed him and, and stuff like that. And he cried out. And Cain said unto him in verse 13, Unto the Lord my punishment is greater than I can bear. And then he said, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth and from the face, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Now, two things I want to pick from this scripture here. And the first thing is this that time had passed. Cain did not deal with the rejection of the sacrifice. Now, it wasn't that he did not know, they knew that they had to bring a sacrifice. Why he brought the first fruits of his crop? and not the blood sacrifice that was um, taught to them. We don't know. We don't know everything that really transpired here, right? But we see that time had passed, and because Cain did not deal with, the, with the, the, the anger at the moment, because remember, the Bible says he was very wroth, means he was really angry. So because he didn't deal with what was going on at the present moment, that if he let it fester, it turned into resentment. So imagine, every time you see brother, vexation. Every time, until finally one day he confronted him in the field, away from the family, confronted him in the field, and he was so angry that he killed him. This is what resentment does. You may not literally take a gun and shoot somebody, you understand? But you kill your brother by, and your sister by what you see. And you kill them by your actions. And you kill them by the way that you move around them. It's not just shooting and this and that. There are many ways you can kill somebody. You can level somebody and bring them down a peg by what you say. Mm -hmm. Remember you have power in words in your mouth, right? Okay. So be careful what you say. The Bible says life and death 
and in the power of the tongue. And you will eat the fruit of it. So whatever you say, you will do. Right? So we see that Cain is one example in the Bible. He was so bitter that he killed. We're going to look at Ruth chapter 1. We're going to look at Naomi. So we're going to look at Ruth chapter 1. And we're going to go to verse 13. Now we know the story of Ruth, right? In the beginning of Ruth. We know, well, for those who don't know it, you have homework to do, you can go and research it for. But Ruth, what happened, it had a famine in Judah, and Ruth and, not Ruth, sorry, Naomi and her husband and her two children. The two children weren't born in the place that they went to, right? The two children were already grown. So what happened, they had left there to go to another place, um, Moab, I think it is, that they would go there for, for um, because it had plenty, so they, they were running from poverty. So we see that what happened there, it happened that, that Naomi's husband died. And then after a period of years, both her sons died. They had married into the land. And we see that not only the husband died, but both children, her two sons. So she went in with her family and she came out empty. So we see in, 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 in verse 13, would you tarry for them until, sorry, yeah. She was talking to her daughter and not telling them to go back to your, your family house. And she don't have any more sons in her womb. And she, so she, she was telling them, would you tarry for them until they were grown, that you would stay from having husbands? Nay, my daughter, for it grieved me much for your sakes, that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And we're going to look at verse 20 and 21 of that same chapter. And it says, And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter. Right? Call me not Naomi. This is after she picked up herself and she went back to where she came from in the beginning. And people start saying, Is this not Naomi? She said, Don't call me Naomi. Don't call me Naomi. And it, you know, in a tricky mind, you could understand how she would say, Don't call me so. I know my name again. Call me Mara. I'm bitter. Ariel bitter. Right? So she say, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty had dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full and the Lord had brought me home again empty. Why then call him Naomi, seeing that the Lord had testified against me and the Almighty had afflicted me? When you're bitter, not this lady was bitter, she lost all her the meal in her life. All the man and she had she lost. Everybody, she son, she husband, she two sons and she husband, she lost them. They weren't coming back. She began to remember time passed in the Bible, right? Time had passed. So she had become bitter. She didn't deal with that grief. And she became bitter. And she didn't just become bitter, but she became bitter against the Lord. Bitter people look for someone to blame. Mm -hmm. And who she looked to blame was God. So she said, the Lord had dealt very bitterly with me. And then she said, I went out full and I came back empty. And she said, the Lord had testified against me and the Almighty had afflicted me. So she saw instead of, the way that her perception was that God had dealt with her. But she, she, was, she was a victim. She was a victim. God was the one who was oppressing her and she was the victim. So she became bitter. Another person we're going to look at is Esau. And we're going to look at Genesis 27. Genesis chapter 27. And we're going to look at verses 37 to 41. So it says here that and Isaac, we're talking about Jacob and Isaac, right? Isaac answered and said, Esau, behold, I have made him my, your Lord. Isaac, Esau and Jacob, Esau and Jacob, right? Sorry, Isaac was the father, Esau and Jacob were the brothers. We know that Jacob was the, um, Esau was the first one, right? And we know the story about the, the, the transaction that went on there with the stealing of the, um, the blessing and stuff like that, right? We know about the story there. So now Isaac, I mean Esau, Esau was the one that was wronged because his birthright was taken, his blessings was taken from him, right? Now Esau also was hungry and the brother take it with, right? So he saw in his mind is thinking that I am the one who the wrong thing was done to. I didn't I was innocent in the whole matter and the wrong was done to me. 
my boyfriend was told and now my blessing, okay, you take my boyfriend out, but you want to take my blessing too. So he said, and Isaac answered and said, so behold, I have made him thy Lord. The person who takes the thing from you, they don't want to get promoted over you. Anything like that ever happened in your office? That the person you're having conflict with and the person you are the innocent one, the one who doing you end up being your boss? That's a difficult situation to deal with it. I'm telling you, from personal experience, I'm telling you. He said, Behold, I've made him thy Lord, and all thy burden have I given to him for thy servants. And with corn and with wine have I sustained him, and what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And he so said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, my father. And he so lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, and of the dew of the heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass that when thou shalt have the dominion, thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father had blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father at hand, then will I slay my brother Jacob. Then will I see, you see what bitterness does? Bitterness looks for revenge. You say I'm mourning for my father, but after that, you're dead. After the time pass, I will level you down, you're dead. You say after, then will I slay my brother Jacob. So we see that Bitterness, if left unchecked. Anger, if left unchecked, turned to bitterness. Bitterness, if not dealt with, well, if it's, it, it, it turns out into murder. It turns out into hatred, violent hatred. So let's look at, um, and, and what happens, your heart also gets stubborn. According to Deuteronomy 29 and verse 19. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 19 says, and it came to pass, and it come to pass, when he heareth the words of this, of this curse, he shall bless himself in his heart, saying, I have peace, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my own heart, to add drunkenness to taste. He says, I, what, what bitterness does, you always think that you are the victim and you are innocent. So when you think you are innocent, you will say, well, she got dead, but I will live, because I didn't do nothing wrong. Right? This is the mindset that you will have. That happened to shape, but you see me? Mm -mm. Even though I will walk in the imagination, so this is something you imagine because it's not the truth. It's your perception. The only truth is the Bible and what the Word of God says, not what mm -hmm. you think, not what you perceive, but the Word of God is the truth. Amen. Everything else has to be measured by the Word of God. If it's not there, take your wrong. If it's your wrong, take your wrong. Take your own, because the word of God cannot be broken. The word of God is settled forever in heaven. So you see that that you, when you are bitter, you think you, your imagination is off. The way that you perceive things is off. We're going to look at one more person, and another person is Job. And we're going to look at the book of Job. Now, like I said, I only took from four people. There are real plenty of people in the Bible that was bitter. So you need to do your homework if you want to know more. So we're going to look at Job chapter 10. Sorry. And from verse 1. It says, My soul is weary of life, and I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say unto God, Do not condemn me. Show me whereof thou hast contended, contendest with me. It is, good, it is good unto thee that thou shouldest oppress is it good unto thee that thou shalt oppress that which thou should despise the work of thine hands and shall shine upon the counsel of the wicked? Hast thou eyes of flesh, or seest thou as a man? Are the days of the are the days as thy days? I as are thy days as the days of man, and thy years as man's days? That thou inquirest after my iniquity and search it after my sin, thou knowest that I am not wicked. And that there is none that can deliver out of thine hand. 
Thine hand hath made me and fashioned me all together round about, yet thou dost destroy me. Remember, I beseech thee, that thou hast made me as the clay, and wilt thou bring me to dust again? Hast thou not poured, out, poured me out like milk, and curdled me like cheese? Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh, and hast fenced me round about with bones, bones and sinews. Thou hast granted me life and favor, and in thy visitation hast preserved my spirit. And these things hast thou hid in thine heart. I know this is with thee. If I sin, then thou makest me, and thou wilt acquit, thou wilt not acquit me for my iniquity. If I be wicked, woe unto me. And if I be righteous, yet will I not lift up my head. I am full of confusion. Therefore see thou mine affliction. For it increaseth. Thou huntest me as a fierce lion, and against thou showest thyself marvelous upon me. Thou renewest witness, thy witness against me, and increaseth thy indignation upon me. Changes and wars are against me. Wherefore then hast thou brought me forth out of the womb? Why you, why you bring me forth? Why are you making me born? If you know all this thing you're going to do to me, why it is that you, why are you born? Why it is that I, why are you dead when I was born? Why are you just dead when I was born? Why are you bring me out for? Oh, that I had given up the ghost. See what I do? Better be dead. And no eyes had seen me. I should have been as though I had not been. Didn't exist. Better didn't exist. I should have been carried from the womb to the grave. Are not my days few? Cease them, and let me alone, that I may take comfort a little, before I go whence I shall not return, even to the land of darkness, and the shadow of death, a land of darkness as darkness itself, and of the shadow of death, without any order, and where the light has darkness. Now we see here with Job, Job, Job had a lot of things. We know the story of Job, right? He had everything. And in one day, everything was gone. While one was speaking, the next one come and said, this happened. And while that one speaking, the next one said, this happened. And you lost your children, you lost your cat, you lost this, you lost, you lost that, you lost your, 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 your pretty skin you had. You lost everything. You just wiped till you cost God on there. I just cost God on there. Thank God he didn't listen to her. Amen. His friends come around now and tell him, it's something you do, you know. That's why it's something you do. That's why you're suffering so. And you know, sometimes we, when we find ourselves in situations, people will tell us that. The ones that we think we, are, we get disappointed and we get resentful because we think they should know better. Right? Or oh, come and comfort me a little bit or something, but you're going and you're telling me it's something you do, you know. I know it's something you do. That's why all of this thing come on you. Because God will do the thing so. Then He now listens to the bad influence and say, better be dead. Why you bring me forth? If I don't suffer all of this thing, why you put me here for you? Give me a take away all of this stuff of stupidness. Why? Why are we watching this thing for? And you know, sometimes we find ourselves in that situation. We find ourselves in a place where we question why. And then, let me tell you something resentments make you to blame God and make you to speak out of turn against the Lord. Make you to judge God wrongfully. God is a just God. Amen. When you see we go through these things as Job was going through this thing, he said, but you blame everything on God. He said, who could, who could deliver me from your hand? Use God enough. Who could deliver me from your hand? He said, I didn't do anything wrong, but you make all this thing happen to me. I didn't do, I want to be innocent when you see resentment makes you think that you are innocent. It screws up with your perception. So these are the four people that we have looked for, looked at in the Bible. Now, when God put him in the place and tell him, listen, hey, pull up your socks. Hold up a minute. You questioning me, you know anything about how everything comes into existence? You know about, you, you talk to the land, you talk to the sea, you draw the line in the water and tell the sea not to come so far? You tell the moon, you call the sun and the, 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 the moon and stars and, thing, and they say, here, am I at your service? You could do all of these things, you, but you're questioning me. God is a wise God. He allows things to happen in your life for a reason. You may not understand the point, but it's a lesson that you have to learn. Listen, it's the lessons that God is teaching us. Now, I am, I am telling you, you see the prayers that we pray in this church? Don't take it for granted. Don't think that it's just words you're muttering. 
I could distinctly remember a couple weeks back, I think it was last, last month, a couple weeks back, Apostle Sunday morning, making me say some prayers. And one of the prayers, Wednesday and Sunday, he repeats the same prayer. And I'm like, hmm, I get frightened. I, I really tell you, sometimes when I post the prayer and give me some prayers to pray, I just be like, Lord, please, don't you fall back on me. I tell you honestly, a person made us pray a prayer that deals with our heart and us saying that anything that is in me, this is just a gist of it, I can't give any good for good play. But anything that is in me, Lord, expose it and move it out. You see that expose it thing? <laughs> expose it and move it out. I could laugh at it now, but at the point I was like, this week I was like, Lord, the things that God does not want in your life, He has a way to expose it. And especially when you pray the prayers, He has a way of exposing it. If you are telling Him, Lord, anything that is in me, that is not of you, remove it. But how will you know when it's removed if you didn't know what it was? Hmm. How will you know that that particular thing was removed if you didn't know what it was? So you see, when things happen in your life, it's because this is not of God. When you realize that this is not of God, this is one of the things that God has exposed that you have to deal with and that he is going to remove out of your life. So when it moves out of your life, you know the freedom that comes with it. Amen. Right? Amen. Everybody understand me so far? Amen. All right. So we're going on again. So we talk about these four people. Four, we only talk about four bitter people in the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. Now we talk, we, we know what bitterness is. We experience bitterness and stuff. When Apostle was telling, was giving us his prayer, you know, like I said, God, I'm uh, I just say a sense of humor because he knows how to deal with me. He created me, he knows how to deal with me. A couple of nights ago, last week, last week, now we have said these prayers, right? And you know, sometimes we say prayers and we forget what we say. And when it happened, we say, Ugh. right? We just pull, kicking at us. But I had asked Apostle the next morning, when this happened, I asked him the next morning, um, did you wake me up? last night. He said no. I said, you sure? You didn't make me up last night? He said no. And I, I didn't realize I was dreaming because sometimes I can't tell reality from dream. I dream so vivid with all my senses. Sight, smell, sound, taste, touch, everything. So sometimes for me it's difficult to see dream from reality. Sometimes about that. But this particular time I, I wasn't sure. So I had to ask him if he woke me up. I knew I got up because after I, it, I was dreaming and in the dream, Apostle was telling me, now I remember Apostle distinctly saying, whenever you dream a man of God in, in a dream, that is God just speaking with you. He said that to me a couple of years ago. So I remember that I kept that to the back of my head and I dreamt Apostle waking me up and telling me to pray. Waking me up and telling me, pray, get up, we have to pray, get up, we have to pray. I didn't even, he, this is the first time he is hearing it, right? So, get up, you have to pray. This morning, Apostle was saying something. He said, God doesn't want to use you, and God doesn't want your time to you spend five two minutes with me. And you're so, be so busy, he doesn't want to spend the time, and you want to do what is on your own. You want to do whatever you want to do. And you wouldn't give God time because it's cutting into what you want to do. I wanted to sleep. God was telling me, get up free. I wanted to sleep. So it doesn't only happen to all, it happens to everybody. It happens to pastors as well. God was telling me, get up and pray three times. And three times, I did not. I did not. I turned and said, I'm very tired. I actually said, I'm very tired. I need to sleep. I'm very tired. I'm exhausted. I need to sleep. The last time I woke up from the sleep because of course I was hitting the bed, knocking the bed like this. Knocking the bed. That's what woke me up from sleep. I asked him and he had no recollection of knocking that bed. He was literally knocking the bed so loud to wake me up and he did not know he was doing it. And I still disobeyed. I didn't I didn't pray. I didn't pray. I didn't get up and pray. But I regret it now. And this is what I regretted now because 
If I guess if I did get a home prayer at that time, that I would not have gone through what I went through. I would not have reacted the way that I did. We sing this song, you are my strength, but we don't fully understand what that means when God is a strength. In every situation, God always has a way out that you will be able. He does not give you more than you can bear. No matter how you, how what going on, he does not give you more than you can bear. We have to guard against bitterness. Like that. When you see things affect you, deal with it immediately. Apostle always says that. Deal with it immediately. Don't let it fester. The longer you take to deal with it, the more the resentment will start to build. And remember, this happens quietly. You won't know until that thing erupts because you don't see when a root growing. You don't see when the root is growing. The root looks the same all the time. But you don't know that the growth takes place over a period of time. Same way that resentment takes place over a period of time. Bitterness takes place over a period of time. And if you're left unchecked, you become a bitter old person and nobody wants to be around you. Nobody wants to be around you because you are constantly complaining, constantly bringing up things that should have been left out already. One, so we're going to deal with some of the things, some of the ways to deal with bitterness. And we see that one of the ways to deal with, bitter, deal with bitterness is to ask for forgiveness. But before we do that, let's look at Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. And it says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Where does resentment reside in the heart? The heart is not, uh, the heart we're talking about is not the beating flesh, but the way that you reason and think and all these things. That is the heart of man. It says, keep your heart with all diligence. Be careful what you think about. Think about what you're thinking about. If you see something is worrying, you deal with it one time. Don't let it fester. It's the out of because out of it, for out of it are the issues of life. Everything that pertains to life goes on in your heart first. So you have to keep it. If you can't keep your heart, give it to God to keep. Keep it, keep it for you. Commit your ways unto the Lord, the Bible says. Alright, commit your ways unto the Lord. If you cannot keep your heart, ask God for the help and the grace to do it. And for the wisdom to do it. We have to first ask for forgiveness. Psalms 51 10 says, Create in me a clean heart of God, renew the right spirit within me. We know that we sing it. The second thing is, yeah, cast me not away from your presence, take not your Holy Spirit away from me. You have to ask for forgiveness. When you say create in me a clean heart, you are asking God to take away that thing that is bothering me, that 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 sin. And and you know when we say sin. We think about the lying and the murdering and the this and the that and the next and the other, but according to what a, a person I was discussing, I don't, I can't quite remember if he said it on the, on the platform or not, but we were discussing something and he said that, you know what sin is? Sin is not always lying, I think he has that to sin. But you know what sin is also? Basically disobeying what God says. God says, don't, for, don't forsake the assembly of yourself together, forsake not the assembly of yourself together, meaning don't stop from the church. We stop coming to church. We justify why we do it. Alright? We stop coming. God says, love your brother. I will love from a distance. We want to justify our own reactions to certain things. But anything we do that is not of God is sin. Not lining up with the word of God is sin. Alright? So we're looking at um, Proverbs 28. And we're looking at verse 13. And it says, He that covereth sin shall not prosper, but whoso co confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Right? So we have to ask for forgiveness. Don't cover up the thing. Even though we think we understand it, if it's bothering us and we, we know we have to confess it. We have to, we have to ask for forgiveness. We have to recognize that we are a bit bitter. We have to recognize that this anger is controlling me. This situation is controlling If this situation is controlling you and you keep thinking about it, you are becoming bitter. Ask God to forgive. We're going to look at Ephesians 4. Like I say, we have plenty of scriptures here, but I try to run quickly. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4 and we're going to look at verse 26. And it says that be angry and sin not. Do not let the sun go down on your heart. You know, we always like to say that, don't let your sun go down on your heart. But this is a scripture verse. 
right? You, the Bible never says don't be angry. It says be angry. But deal with the anger. Don't sin by keeping it in your heart. And keep festering over and over and over and over. Right? Don't let the sun go down on your heart. Deal with it immediately. Deal with it. You don't know when, what will happen during the course of the night. You don't know the day, the time, the minute, the hour, the second that Christ is going to put in his appearance. We have to be living in readiness. And we cannot be living in readiness if we are harboring these things. The word of God says, lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Right? We have to always be ready. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to look at verses 14. Alright, and it says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Right? If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. You have to ask for forgiveness both from God and from the person that you're holding the bitterness against. The resentment, the hurt. Even though you may think you're justified in being bitter, the word of God says, ask for forgiveness. If you can't forgive the person, then God can forgive you. Plain and simple. We can't break what God's saying, good, right? Yeah. Right. So one and another thing with you. No, we'll get to that afterwards. Right. So we have to ask for forgiveness. The second thing is to know that God requires forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4. God requires forgiveness. Ephesians 4, and we're going to look at verse 32. It says, Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Even as Christ, for even as God for Christ's sake had forgiven you. God requires forgiveness. Know that God requires forgiveness. It says, Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake had forgiven you. And second Romans 12 and verse 18. I'm going to look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. And it says, If it be possible, as much as light in you, live peaceably with all men. If it be possible, as much as light within you, live peaceably with all men. Alright? God is asking us to live peaceably with all men. Know that God, number three, know that God empowers, can empower us to forgive. You know, sometimes we say, you know, I really can't forgive that person. No. Or I forgive the person, but I can't forget. Saying I forgive and not forgetting means I can't, I didn't forgive. You have to, you have, you have to forgive and forget. Move on, let's pass. Move on. Two seconds away, is, two seconds ago is passed. Too. One mm -hmm. second ago is passed. Too. Mm -hmm. Right? So we see that know that God can empower us to forgive. Philippians 4 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Even though we feel that we may not be able to do it, God says He has given us His strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The strength is not just physical strength, but also spiritual and emotional strength. Amen. God is going to give you that strength that you need to go and face that person. Even if the person shoots you down. Even if, listen, just because you go to the person and you ask for forgiveness doesn't mean that the person is happy, will accept you, eh? It doesn't mean that everything will be hunky dory. The thing is, you are obedient to God by going and doing what He says. Leave the rest to God. He will deal with that afterwards. But you have to do your part, right? This is not a magic thing where you just wave a wand and you go on. You have to do your part. God. Know that God empowers us to forgive. He gives us the strength to do it, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The next thing is we have to forbear. We have to forbear. As Christians, as children of God, as men and women of God, as God's chosen child, we have to forbear. What does it mean to forbear? Forbear simply means to have patience. Everybody is at different levels, right? And some people might rub it the wrong way and, and, and you might think they should have known better. But God is saying to forbear. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 2. Sorry. Yeah, Ephesians 4 verse 2 says, With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing, forbearing one another in love. Apostle talked this morning about love. And I was just laughing because I said, Oh, God, listen, you're going to start to preach my message too. But, anyways, one spirit. Amen? Amen. Holy Spirit. So, we're going to look at 
Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13. Colossians, 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 Apple, Tomato, Tomato. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13. And it says, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do he. Christ didn't have to forgive us because of the stupidness that we do. Before we knew him and after we knew him. He didn't have to forgive us for it. But he did. If God could forgive us the stupidness that we find ourselves, we know we deserve stupidness. Nobody ever tell you that. We know we all do stupidness. Real foolishness. Foolish is not dotish. Eh? Foolish, dotish is living under your father's house. Foolish, however, Foolish, however, means you don't have the right, you, you can't think right. You don't have the right way of thinking. That's what foolishness means. But don't you just really living under your father's house. Right? So there's a, so if somebody tells you you're real foolish and don't you know what that means, right? Good. Come on from under your father's house and go find your place. Alright? Forbearing one another, forgiving one another, even if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave, forgive you also. Now, listen, I am not saying this is going to be easy. Because we all know our own pain, right? We know the pain, the hurt that, that the situation caused and whatever it is. But I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but what I'm saying is it's possible because God has given us his strength. Amen. And it is demanded. It is what God requires of us to do. It does not matter with age. Oh, you older than me, you want to come to me. Why I older than you. Fisher, you want to come to me. I older than you. You want to come to me. You understand? I want to go to you. Respect your elders. <laughs> I'm just picking on an official. <laughs> Respect your elders. I'm just picking on an official because I'm not good. <laughs> right? So know that God can empower us. We have to forbear. We also have to love. And I would not go deep into love because of us already done that this morning. Spoke about love, right? First John 3 and verse 15. We still have some scripture. So, first John. Chapter 3 and verse 15 says, Whosoever hated his father is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, hatred is one of the things that causes bitterness. So, we see that we can't say we love God, and one of these scriptures will say, You can't say you love God and hate your brother, I know. But that don't happen. Yeah, that happen. God is love, not God will be love. God is love. If God's love is living in us, God is love, that love is supposed to shine through. And God's love is, guess what? Unconditional. So you have to have unconditional love towards the other person as well. Forbearing, be patient with the person. Have unconditional love towards that person. Right? It doesn't matter. It's not what the person could do for you. And it's not nothing like that for you. Obligations so are nothing like that. God says to love that person unconditionally. It does not matter what the person did love that is what you owe them love all right because all say that all you owe people is love so we have to love first john 4 7 and it says we love it let us love one another for love is of god and everyone that loveth it is born of god and knows god he that loveth not knoweth not god for god is love all right god is love let's look at verse 20 of that same john first john 4 First John 4 and verse 20. And it says, If any man say, Love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. And he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? If you say, I hate you, but I love God, well, you can hate the person you see, but you, uh, but you want to love somebody you can't see. What kind of madness is that? What kind of madness is that? Right? You want to say, I love God, you know? Everybody wants to say I love God because we can't see God. But how do we see God? We see God every day, you know. But you know how we see God? In each one of us. We recognize the Spirit. Spirit call it the Spirit. We see God every day in each one of us. So if we don't love, if I don't love you, Verna, that means I don't have love of God in me. Right? To recognize the love of God that is in you. You understand? Putting all personality aside. Putting all these kind of ups and downs and quirks and this and that and whatever hiccups we should say aside. If I can't see the love of God in you and identify with the love of God in you, something is wrong with me. I don't have the love of God in me. Right? If I say I love God and hate my brother, I'm lying. And you know what the Bible says about 
I am a liar. And you know what the Bible says about liars? All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burns forever and ever. All liars. All they want to burn? Continue lying. I'll let it tell you. Continue lying. So we see that love is one of the things. So let's look at Hebrews 13. Quickly, I, I will finish this now. Just, just bear with me a little bit. Hebrews chapter 13. These scriptures are very important. Huh? I'm reading from verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Now the Bible keeps speaking about this love. I will just leave it there. We'll just do verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. That says enough. No matter what's going on in, in between or whatever it is, whatever skirmishes that we have with one another, the Bible says let brotherly love continue. You have brothers and sisters and siblings in your house, right? And it always, always disagree. But all the come together as one. Why? Because it is blood. So why it is that Christ's blood, which is greater than every other blood that we share together, when we have problems with each other, we can't come back together? Why, why is that? It's one blood, you know, Christ's blood, yeah. that supersedes every other blood. Right? So let's look at the next thing. Pray for those who hurt you. And this is such a difficult thing to do. Pray for those who hurt you. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 5. Quickly, 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 quickly. Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 44. Matthew 5, 44 says, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them and curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use you. And persecute you. Now, does that sound easy? Mm -mm. But care of it not. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use you. And persecute you. You have to do your part. Leave everything else up to God. God will handle that situation so long as you be obedient to what his word says. Amen? Amen. We're going to look at quickly at Job chapter 42. And this is so important. Job chapter 42. I'm looking at verse 10. Job chapter 42 and verse 10 says, And, Job, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now we'll talk about Job earlier as being one of the bitter persons, right? So now we see that the thing the, the, the table turn. So after Job realized his stupidity by finding God face and God deal with him, he come back now, similar down like Baji, and come back now. And when God spoke to his heart, because one of his friends was against him and pushing him here, he wiped him and so on. This happened and that happened. We know the story of Job, right? And he said, and the word of God says, and the Lord turned again the captivity of Job. Bitterness keeps you captive. It does not, you cannot move from the spot you're in if you do not settle. You can't move. It's like the elephant tied to the tree for years and you remove the chain and the elephant did not know the chain was removed and still stand up there. You understand? So bitterness keeps you in one position all the time. You cannot move. A root does not uproot itself. A tree does not uproot itself and go somewhere else if that condition is not good. It stays there and fight it out. But we have to know that God is freeing us from all of these different things, right? This, this bitterness, God is talking to us today to give it over to him, right? He said the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Now, you would know that you are free from bitterness when you can pray for the person who has done your wrong. If you can't pray for them, you still need to work on that issue. If you cannot bring them before God in prayer, genuinely from your heart and say, Lord, bless that person. If you cannot do that, you still need to deal with that bitterness. That is a sign of, okay, I give it up. I give it up. I give up my rights. Lord, you have your way. And I, I felt that I was right in being, and being justified by my actions and by what I've said. But Lord, I give up all those rights for you and what you say. Mm. When I could be able to pray for Verna, if Verna has done me wrong, if I'm able to pray for Verna, genuinely from my heart, I want to bless her and enlarge her and elevate her and pray my heart sincerely for her, then I know I've passed it. God has removed it. Right? God has removed it. So we see that captivity, God turned again the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. That is so important. I told, I told you, all the scriptures here are very important. The next thing is to let it go. After you don't, after you don't ask for forgiveness and you know God could empower you and if you bear with the person and you love the person and pray for the person, you have to let it go. Eh? 
let it go. Ephesians 4 and verse 31. I think we read that already. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31. Or we read 32. So we're going to read verse 31 and it says, What does the Bible say about it? It says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And I was asking Savior this morning, Savior, you know what's malice? Savior, I have no idea what is malice. Malice is the bad intent you have towards your person. You are telling a person not to know. Remember, bitterness is silent. You are telling or rightly say, why, why nothing you gone? Why you go around and break your foot? You didn't know rightly say it, but wishing on the person bad in your heart is what is malice. As simple as that. That is what is malice. So that all bitterness, all wrath, all, all anger, wrath and anger is two different things as you can see here, right? And clamor, clamor is loud speaking, speaking loud, right? Clamor and evil speaking, gossiping, pulling on the sister or the brother in front of somebody else and trying to encourage that person to look at them from your point of view, right? Evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us. So we need to let it go. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 8 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. He shall direct thy paths. Right? And, it, and then it goes on to say in verse 7, it says, Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Don't think you're, you're right. What, what you see is the right thing. If the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. Measure it up with what the word of God says. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't think I'm justified. God is the only one who justifies us. We cannot justify our own selves. Amen? Amen. The next thing is we were telling God and our apostle brought that scripture today and it's in Ephesians. I'm going to look at it quickly. I will be finished in a bit. Ephesians. Where is Ephesians? Somebody stole Ephesians from my Bible. Ephesians chapter where am I? 3. And verse 17. That Christ may dwell in you, in your, in your hearts by faith, that you will be rooted and grounded in love. Again, you see the scripture came back. He was speaking about the same scripture this morning, and the scripture came back again. He said that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that he being rooted. Now, when you say by faith, Christ dwells in your heart by faith, it's not by what you feel. Because there are sometimes you don't even feel God's presence anywhere around you. Especially when you see you find yourself in situations that you overreact. You don't feel God's presence around you. You just feel like you haven't shut up and you can't hear nothing. And you're talking and you're just going to the ceiling and bounce back and hitting you. But that is just a trick and a lie of the enemy because God says he's never going to leave and he's never going to forsake us. That's all covenant scripture. I will not fail thee, I will not forsake thee. We have to come to the understanding by faith, know that God is still there. By faith, we know God has not thrown us out. He says, as many, he said, I will in no wise cast out. If we listen to our prosecution last night from our point forth, he said, I will in no wise cast you out. You can't do nothing that I will cast you out. But you, you choose to walk away from me. We choose to walk away from God. God does not cast us out. God is not a God where he makes us with three fingers. When he holds it, he holds it tight. Is you, you are the one that chooses to walk away by your choice, you choose to walk away. Right? He said that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that he be rooted and grounded in love. So everything you do has to be grounded in love. This is some of the ways that you can get rid of bitterness, right? May be able to comprehend all the saints, what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. If you don't have God's love in you and you can't let it go, if you're not rooted in God, and you can't let it go, know that you're half big. You don't have the fullness. You're not full. You're half big. Something is lacking. You're not all together there. Amen? So we have to be rooted in God. The last thing is to seek peace and to pursue it. After we ask for forgiveness and we know that God requires forgiveness and we know that we can be empowered to, to forgive, we have to forbear. We, we brought ourselves to understand that we have to forbear, we have to love, we have to pray for the person who hurt us, we have to let it go, we have to be rooted in God, we also have to, have to seek peace and pursue it. We're going to look at Psalms chapter 34. 
Psalm chapter 34 verse 14 says, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. All right, seek peace and pursue it. And the next scripture is Romans chapter 12. Let's look at Romans chapter 12. Oh, thank you. If it be possible, as much as I can, you live peaceably with all men. All right, so we have to seek peace and pursue it. So we have to look for ways to find, we have to look for the peace, the, pe the, the common ground, the peace in between. If you're seeking for something, it means that you're looking for something. It doesn't happen automatically. But just seek peace and run after it. You'll just seek it, run behind it. Keep running behind it. You'll mm -hmm. give it up. Seek peace and pursue it. Never say stop pursuing. Say pursue it. Mm -hmm. Run behind it. Every time the situation comes or the person does something, run behind peace. Seek it. Look for the peace in that. Maybe she didn't mean it like that. Maybe he didn't mean it like that. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Maybe I took it wrong. Is what they say the right thing? Is what they're saying right? Why did it make me angry? Is what they are saying right? You understand? Seek peace and pursue it. If it's the right thing, ask God to forgive you. Alright? And last, a person who is rooted in bitterness, remember this, cannot be rooted in God. If you're rooted in bitterness, you cannot be rooted in God. Let's all stand to our feet this morning. Feet, not feet. Let's all stand to our feet this morning. Sorry, I had an Esther. You know, we train you like you're adding Esther to everything. Cokes. <laughs> like adding Esther to every single thing. Alright, so before I hand over to Apostle Canada, I want to ask is there anyone struggling with anything? Any kind of bitterness, any kind of thing that you know you can't let go and you need the help of God to let go. The altar is open, you all can come. We are not judging anybody, I'm not judging anybody because I have found myself in that position this week. If there is something in your heart that you can't let go because somebody did you wrong and you can't let it go and you need the help of God to let it go, you need to walk out. Deal with it now. Don't let a minute again pass. Don't let two minutes again pass. Just walk out. Ask God, Lord, I really can't deal with this thing, you know. No matter who it is you're expert, no matter what it is, if you can't let go, come out. Ask God. Don't look at anybody around you. It's you, God dealing with you, not me, not Sister Guna, not Sister Toya. You, he dealing with. If there is something in your heart, if you don't want to come out, no problem. Apostle will just, I will just invite Apostle now to come and pray for everyone. That whatever root of bitterness or whatever it is that has been growing and festering in our lives, that God is going to help us to deal with it and we will follow what he has said in his word forgiving one another bearing up with one another praying for one another whatever it is that he has asked us to do so i invite the pastor kenneth now to um, pray for everyone amen, amen. shall we all lift up our hands to god and pray?